Well, there was once this young man, and he was returning home one night, and he was almost struck by lightning. And his close encounter with death so troubled him that he decided to devote his life to religion. So he became a Catholic priest. However, while he was very religious, he could not find peace. And so his mentor encouraged him to pursue an academic career. And it was actually while he was teaching through the book of Romans, while he was teaching through the book of Romans, he made this amazing discovery that you can be justified, you can be made right with God by faith. And this rediscovery of this truth, justification by faith, it lifted the curtain of darkness that had been over Western civilization, and the Great Reformation began. And that young man, his name was Martin Luther. Well, a few centuries later, there was another young man, and he was returning home from the New World. He'd been a missionary, but he'd been a complete failure, a failure morally, a failure in his ministry. And he, as he was returning home, the ship which he was returning home on, it encountered this severe storm. It almost sank. And in the midst of the storm, as he was seeing the wind and the waves rise, he realized that he had no assurance whatsoever of where he would go if he were to die. But on this same ship, there was these Moravian brethren. And in the midst of the storm, they were singing hymns of praise to God. And so this young man decided that when he returned to England, he would find out what they had that he didn't. And so he went to one of their reading rooms. And while someone was reading out Martin Luther's preface to his commentary on the book of Romans, this young man said that his heart was strangely warmed. And that young man was John Wesley. And John Wesley then went all throughout England on horseback, sharing the gospel with any person who would listen. Now, when you think about both of these young people, Martin Luther, John Wesley, what did they have in common? Well, both of them made an amazing impact in their generation. But I think what they both had in common is simply they had met with God and they had been filled with his holy zeal. Um, Steve Addison, in a book on movements, he writes, Church history is not made by well-financed, well-resourced individuals and institutions. History is made by men and women of faith who have met with the living God, people of deep spiritual conviction. You know, I wonder, are you a person who is filled with holy zeal, a person who has met with God. All throughout the Bible, you will see people meeting with God, and their meeting with God changes them, and they are filled with his zeal. You know, I was thinking about the City Reach movement, and I was thinking about what are some of our burning convictions? What are some of the things that God has done within us? And as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about the City Reach family of churches and our burning convictions, there's probably one conviction that for me stands out above all the other convictions. And it's this conviction that I want to share with you this morning in our time together. So if you haven't got your Bible open yet or your screen, just light it up to the first chapter of Colossians and verse 15 to 23. And now most uh, biblical commentators believe that this section of Scripture is like an early hymn of the church. This was a, something that was sung by the early Christians and in this early hymn that Paul takes and he puts into his letter, it paints this beautiful portrait of Christ. And if there's anything that you and I need this morning as we come into this place, is we need again a fresh glimpse of the greatness of Jesus. Because we tend to forget, don't we? We tend to forget who he is and what he's like and what he's done. Well, first, in this great hymn, what we see is we see the hymn writer talk about the supremacy of Christ's nature. In verse 15, he begins by stating, he is the image of the invisible God. Now, the Greek word for the word there, image, is the word icon. 
Uh, the word image in Greek refers to an object that has been shaped to resemble the form or an appearance of something else. Uh, one of the ways that we know how, what words mean in the Bible is you can look up all the different references to a particular word in the Bible, or what you can do is you can go to other sources outside of the Bible to see how the word was used at the time. And it's interesting that we have this papyrus letter from the first century where a soldier called Apion is writing to his father. And near the end of the letter, he writes, I send you a little portrait of myself painted by Eutamon. And the word he uses for portrait there is the same Greek word icon, because a portrait is something that resembles the form or an appearance of a person. And this is how we use the word icon today. You might have an icon on your phone or on your computer, and that icon is a picture that if you press that icon, it, will, it represents a computer program, and the computer program will start up. And of course, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, we read that when God created humanity, he created them in his image. He created them to represent him. As they reigned and ruled, they would represent his character. They would resemble his moral character to all humanity. Now, of course, in Genesis chapter 3, we read about the fall of humanity. And so now human beings no longer represent God. Then Jesus comes along, and as Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God. But there is a big difference between the first Adam, who was created in the image of God, and Jesus. And what is it? Well, whereas Adam was created in the image of God, notice that it says in the text that Jesus is the image of God. As the divine Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, he is the exact image of God because he is God. And so therefore to see Jesus is to see the invisible God. You know, one of the essential characteristics of God is that God is spirit. We as human beings, we have a material part, we have this body, and we have an immaterial soul. But the thing about God is that God is immaterial. He is spirit. But when you see Jesus, Jesus makes the invisible God visible. So as the Apostle John says in 1 John verse 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And so by using this phrase, Paul is asserting a very important thing about Jesus, that Jesus is the ultimate one who reveals God to humanity. Now, in our world, our world is full of people who make claims about God, who claim, to, can, who claim to tell you about God. Buddha claimed that if you follow the eightfold path, you will get this spiritual experience. Um, you know, Joseph Smith claimed to have some special spectacles that would interpret these gold tablets that contain revelation from God. Muhammad claimed that uh, he, he, he had this revelation from Allah. But Jesus is different and stands out above all these other people who make claims about God because he is God himself who comes down to reveal God to us. And in the first century, it was no different. There was many people who were making claims about God, and it seems that there were these heretics who were infiltrating the church, and they were teaching that since God is holy and this world is unholy, that God had created these emanations that emanated from God, and that Jesus was just one of these emanations. As New Testament scholar D.A. Carson writes, they may have spoke, spoken well of Christ in warm terms, but in the last result, they saw him as a created being and therefore as less than God. But Paul makes it clear, and you need to make it clear, that Jesus isn't just some created being. Jesus is God. He is the image of the invisible God. To think anything less of Jesus shows that you have a mind blinded by the enemy, as 
Paul warns in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So Jesus is supreme in his nature. He is the one, the one alone, who reveals God to us. Uh, A number of years ago, I read this book by Michael Reeves called Christ Our Life. And he begins the first chapter by saying this, what is it like in eternity? What's there? For millennia, the human imagination has groped and guessed, peering into the darkness. And in the darkness, it has dreamed of dreadful gods and goddesses, of devils and powers, or of space and ultimate nothingness. Staggered by the immensity, we are left terrified of what there might be. If there is a God behind all of this, what is he like? Michael Reeves writes, here then is the revolution for all our dreams, our dark and frightening imaginings of God. There is no God in heaven except the one revealed to us by Jesus. F.T. Torrance writes, there is in fact no God behind the back of Jesus, No act of God other than the act of Jesus. No God but the God we meet and see in Him. Jesus Christ is the open heart of God, the very life and love of God poured out to redeem humankind. The mighty hand and the power of God stretched out to heal and to save. All things are in God's hands, but the hands of God and the hands of Jesus in life and in death are the same. So Jesus is supreme in His nature. He reveals God to us because He is God. But then Paul goes on to say that that not only is Jesus supreme in his nature, he's supreme over creation. In verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, if you, like me, have had um, the Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on your door, you know, one of the things, passages that they'll open up to is they'll open up to Colossians 1 here, and they'll use this term firstborn to say that Jesus was just a created being of God. Uh, And this term firstborn, it can mean first in the order of time. Like my firstborn daughter is Hannah. She's my firstborn. But this, this word also can refer to one who is preeminent in rank. And in the Old Testament, this is how this term is often used. For example, you have Esau and Jacob. And even though Esau was born first, Jacob was the firstborn. He was given the blessing of the firstborn son. In my family, I am the secondborn son. I have an older brother. I have a younger brother, Joel. And my younger brother, Joel, he has inherited the farm. He's the farmer. I think he's the smart one of us three, because <laughs> the farm's a big place. And uh, it's been fascinating to me that as I went home uh, to Queensland and visited my family, my parents ne- really rely on my younger brother now. My younger brother makes all the decisions about the farm. He looks after my aging parents. And I often joke, you're the firstborn now, Joel. <laughs> you're the firstborn son. You're the chosen one. And this is how this term is being used here, that Jesus is the one who is preeminent in rank. He is preeminent over all creation. Now, why is he preeminent over all creation? Well, Paul says it is because for by him all things were created. How many things? All things. How many things? All. So if all things are created through Jesus, Jesus can't be a created thing, right? He can't be a created thing if he created actually all things. Now, Paul, he makes certain that we understand the scope of this by using some prepositional phrases. He says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. In heaven, the realm of God, on earth where we live. Visible or invisible, the things that we see, the things that we don't see. And then he says, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, this refers to the various ranks of angels. You see, as I've said, not only is there this physical realm, but there's also a spiritual realm. And the Bible says that there's various ranks and classes of angels. Now, the heretical teachers, they were teaching the Colossians that in order to have fullness of spiritual experience, they needed to worship angels. But Paul asserts, 
far from Jesus being a created thing and less than an angel. Jesus is above all the angels and angelic realm. So Jesus is supreme over all creation because he created all things. But then he says, and all things were created through him and for him. You see, the purpose of all creation is to give Jesus glory. It was created through him, and it was created for him. You know, one of my mentors, Jim Gibson, I remember him once saying that whenever anyone hears the name Jesus, they are drawn to him. Just hearing that name Jesus, there's something that goes off in people's hearts because as John says, in him, Jesus, there is life. And in his life is the light of men. You know, people instinctively know, they instinctively know that there's something about Jesus that is worth looking into. You know, I remember reading this book by John Dixon, and John says, what is the fundamental doctrine that enables evangelism? And he says, it is the doctrine of God that there is one God who exists, Do you know, Jesus is Lord, not only of all the people who are gathered here together today to proclaim and confess that he's Lord, but Jesus is Lord over every single person in our city. Jesus is the Lord of all the people in Nepal. Jesus is the Lord of all the people in the Middle East. Jesus is the Lord of everyone. We go out and proclaim that Jesus is Lord because he is Lord. He is the Lord of everyone. All things were created through him, and all things were created for him. And now let's just say I went to your house, and you had one of those u new coffee, mach- coffee machines. You know, the sort that George Clooney loves to, you know, make coffee in, the Nescafe, the really expensive ones, right? Now, I'd probably be pretty excited if I heard that you had a, a, a beautiful Nescafe coffee machine I'd be like excited to come to your house because I would be able to get coffee, right? But let's say I came into your house and rather than that coffee machine being used to make coffee, I walked into your house and that coffee machine is being used as a doorstop. Now what would I conclude? I would conclude two things. Firstly, I would conclude that you didn't know what that coffee machine's purpose was, wouldn't I? Because why use it as a doorstop when you could make beautiful coffee? And the second thing that I would conclude is I would conclude that that is the waste of a coffee machine. Because that coffee machine has been made to make beautiful coffee. Your life is wasted if your life is not being used for the purpose of bringing glory to Jesus. Because you were created by him and you were created for him. You were created to give him honor and glory and worship with your life. All things were created by him, and all things were created for him. And verse 17 says, and he is before all things, meaning that before anything else existed, Jesus existed. Before anything else that was made, Jesus existed. You know, you go into some cities around our world and you look at the impressive structures, right? You go to the Gold Coast, as I've been there recently, and there is impressive roller coasters, impressive high-rise buildings, impressive things. But these came into a being, and they came into being at a certain point in time, and they will one day, in a day, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, they will come to an end. But Jesus existed before anything else existed. In in John chapter 8, he said, he expressed his eternality. He said, before Abraham was, you know what he said? He said, I am. And the people at that time knew what he was saying. They picked up stones to stone him because he was claiming to be eternal like God. And then finally, Paul says in verse 17, and in him all things are hold together. Not only is he the creator of all things, not only were all things created for him, but also he is sustaining all things. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that all things are upheld by the word of his power. Do you realize how powerful this is? Your life, I know this is hard for us as Westerners to realize, 
because we live in a world where we have this excluded middle. You have the realm of God and what God does over here in your private life, and then you have your public life over here. And we tend to separate these two things so these two things don't mix, and so we, we don't really know how my private life and my public life go together. And so we tend to live in a mechanistic world where we just, you know, six days of the week we rely on ourselves, and on the seventh day we come to church. But the Bible is teaching that actually Jesus right now is upholding all things by the word of his power. He's upholding your life right now by the word of his power. You know, um, I was confronted by my mechanistic understanding of this world when I went to Nepal for the very first time and I got sick. And uh, and some of the pastors, the Nepalese pastors, gathered around me to pray for me. And as they gathered around me, they prayed for my healing. And they didn't pray like our Western type of prayers where we sort of pray to give people comfort. They were really asking God to intervene in my situation. We had uh, Pastor Chandran out uh, from Nepal for our conference and... Uh, I spent some time with Pastor Chandran, and he said one of the most important things you can do, Timon, for your people is pray for them, because God can do more for them than you can do. I thought, no, 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 I need to do stuff. I need to get out and do stuff. Pastor Chandran is like, no, 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 you need to pray, because God can work in their lives more than you can. See, this just reveals how much we have bought into a mechanistic world. And the anxiety that we feel, the anxiety levels in our life demonstrate this reality that I don't know whether we really believe that all things are upheld by the word of his power, that he is before all things, that in him all things hold together. So do you see the supremacy of Christ in his nature, the supremacy of Christ over creation? But finally in this hymn, we have the supremacy of Christ over the church. In verse 18, Paul says, and he is the head of the body, the church. Now the Bible uses many metaphors to describe the church. The church is a family, but probably one of the greatest metaphors is the church is the body, with Jesus as the head of the church. And what does a head do? A head gives direction. And you can lose many appendages. You can lose your ears. You can probably lose your nose. You can lose an arm. You can lose a leg. But I think if you lose your head, you're a goner. You need your head. And it's interesting, many heretical movements, they often are led by a, a, a strong leader who claims to be the head. And maybe that's what was happening in Colossae as this person was coming in and he was claiming to be this great leader. But Paul says, there's only one leader in the church. It's Jesus. He's the head, the head of the church. Now, why is he supreme over his church as the head of the church? Well, it says down in verse 18 that he is the beginning. The term beginning means in Greek, the one with whom a process begins. You see, God is creating a new humanity. And he started this with Jesus. And it's built upon, as he says, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. This new humanity is built upon the resurrection of Jesus. Now, once again, we've seen that term firstborn. It doesn't mean first in rank, but it means the preeminent one over the dead. You see, Jesus wasn't the first person that was resurrected, right? Remember in John 11, who was resurrected there? Lazarus was resurrected. But Jesus is the supreme one over the resurrection. As he said to Mary, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. The church as a movement is based upon the reality that the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive. We are not worshiping a dead man here this morning. We're exalting a risen, resurrected Savior. And it was the truth of the resurrection that pushed the disciples forward to proclaim to the whole world 
The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. But look down in verse 19. Paul says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. The word fullness is a key term in Colossians. It's used eight times in this letter, and it means the sum total of all divine power and attributes. So the Father was pleased to have his fullness dwell in his Son. Not only was the early church a movement that was based upon the resurrection of Jesus, but it was a movement based upon the gift of the Spirit. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus, and Jesus sent forth the Spirit to indwell the church. Verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by his blood. This is the cosmic Jesus. The curse in Genesis 3 has been reversed by Jesus' work on the cross. And one day it will be consummated when Jesus comes back and all the kingdoms of this world will be handed over to King Jesus and he will hand them over to God in the end so that God will be all in all. You know, the word for gospel in the Bible has a very interesting interesting background. It describes good news, good news. And often um, what would happen is when Greek city-states would go to war, they would go to war against one another, and then a messenger would be sent with the good news of the victory of the king. And he would come into often the defeated, <laughs> the defeated town, and he would proclaim the good news that his army had won and he would give the terms of peace. Our army is coming, your king has been defeated, and here are the terms of peace. And if you want to, you want, you want to get right with the, the king who's coming, you better accept the terms of peace because the king is coming. You know what they often did with the messenger? Often killed the messenger. Doesn't that give us a great background for the gospel? The king is coming. A mighty victory has been won. And he is offering forth the terms of peace. You who were once alienated and hostile to God, you can be reconciled to God this morning through the death of his son and made holy and righteous in his sight. See, the church is a movement based upon the resurrection, based upon the gift of the Spirit, based upon the proclamation of the gospel, of the victory that Jesus won at the cross. At the cross. And so we have this amazing picture of Jesus in this hymn. He's supreme in his character. He is God. He is supreme over creation. He created all things. All things were created for him, and he's upholding all things. And he's supreme over the church. He's the head of the church. You've got something to worry about if the head of the church, if the head of this church is Andrew Green. But you've got nothing to worry about if the head of the church is Jesus. Nothing to worry about if the head of the church is Jesus. Isn't that great? A great truth to remember who is the head of the church. Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, is this just a good theology lesson? lesson? Well, it is. It is a good theology lesson. But there's one little phrase that I left out as I was going through those verses, and it's found in verse 18, and it's this very important phrase that in all things he might be preeminent. Paul says, Paul paints this picture of the supremacy of Christ, and he says, so that in all things he might be preeminent. The word preeminent means first, in a class of his own. Jesus, Jesus' supremacy means that he deserves the preeminency. He deserves to be in a class of his own in your life. He deserves the first place. One of the burning convictions of the City Reach movement, I know of Andrew's heart, of my heart, of this church's heart, is that because of who Jesus is in his person, over creation, over the church, he deserves the preeminency. He deserves to be in a class of his own. He deserves first place. At City Reach, we put it like this. We exist to bring glory to God. 
We exist to be enraptured with God, to worship God, to bring honor to God, so that Lord Jesus, you are Lord of my life, and I, I surrender all things to you. You are Lord. We exist to bring glory to God, and then joy to our city. True joy comes in a life where you grasp the greatness of Jesus, and in view of his greatness, you fall down on your knees and you say, Jesus, you are my Lord. I give everything to you and surrender all things to you. Because of his supremacy, he deserves the preeminency. And of course, we all fail at this goal of making Jesus preeminent in our life. We all have indwelling sin, but that's why we have the beautiful grace of God. Maybe today, as I finish this message, I want to ask you the question, is Christ preeminent in your life? Is he preeminent in your family? Is he preeminent in your marriage? Is he preeminent in the way that you do life? Or is subtly something else come in? Because when the curtain is parted and the glory of King Jesus is revealed, every single person falls down before him and realizes how great he is and that he is worthy, worthy of your worship, worthy of your devotion. Well, let me pray.